Hello, everyone. I'm Christine Pelosi, chair of the California Democratic Party Women's Caucus. Welcome to our Women's History Month Power Hour. We are thrilled to be joined by hundreds of you. Introduce yourselves in the chat. You are going to hear from some of California's amazing, amazing women. You know, we are so blessed in California. As your chair, I travel around the country and I talk to women's groups and the states will be lucky to have one or two members of Congress or one statewide elected official. Well, we have dozens of Democratic women members of Congress and so many uh, statewide women elected officials. And of course, uh, led by, of course, our own California Democrat, Kamala Harris, Vice President of the United States of America. So we are truly blessed and all of this is possible because of the work that you've done over the years. And of course, we all are here. Um, the trailblazers you will meet in turn um, stand on the shoulders of the original abolitionists and suffragettes who fought so hard for women's rights. As you know, we are committed to equity. We are committed to inclusion and we are committed to making sure to lift up the voices of all women, but particularly native women, black women, Latinas, Asian American Pacific Islander women. And of course, um, we have some dear friends with us tonight who are joining us from our various caucuses throughout the party. I know our Disabilities Caucus members are here among others that I've seen in the chat. So thank you all for everything you do. You make our party better, which in turn allows us to make people's lives better. So as we begin today, uh, let us um, give thanks to all the women trailblazers in our own lives. I wanna pay tribute to my mother's mom who was born today in 1909 in Italy and came over to America um, crossing through Ellis Island, Annunziata Lombardi, and she became Nancy D'Alessandro. And I know that I carry her dreams with me, uh, as did my mom. And um, although they wanted my mom to be a nun, which of course would have precluded my presence here today. So I'm glad my mom went a different path and is our speaker of the house and um, is the mother to my <laughs> to, to me and, and, and grandmother to my daughter. So uh, we love you all very much and we're excited to uh, begin today. And so in the spirit of all of our foremothers uh, whose dreams we carry with us, uh, let us begin and let us start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag, the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice or all, someday. As you can tell, we're joined by our ASL interpreter tonight. I wanna to thank her and our wonderful technical team and the staff of the California Democratic Party. Hello, California Democratic Women's Caucus. It's always a joy and privilege to be back in my political home with California Democrats, and especially to be with our powerful Women's Caucus. Thank you, Christine Pelosi, for your invitation. I'm especially excited to be with you to celebrate Women's History Month this year. Today, I bring greetings from the most diverse House of Representatives in our history, with a record-shattering 122 women. And I'm also thrilled to celebrate with you the great milestone for our country with California's own, our Vice President Kamala Harris, working in partnership with President Biden in the White House the first woman, the first black woman, and the first Asian American woman vice president in our nation's history. Even as we mark these great first with all Americans who cherish our beautiful diversity, our hearts are heavy as well from the rise in attacks on the Asian American Pacific Islander community. House Democrats under the leadership of Doris Matsui and the chair of the caucus, Judy Chu, the Democrats are working in community with advocates across the country to stop anti-AAPI hate crimes and to lift up communities of color that are being the brunt of the burden of these difficult times. We are doing so in concert, of course, with our president and vice president and an administration that works to uplift everyone in our country. As we applaud the contributions that women have made to America throughout our history and continue to make every day, we are very much aware of the need to keep building on the progress we have made. Just this month, the women of our Democratic House majority advanced several pieces of legislation of important significance 
to all women in America. California women led the way. Among them, the Equal Rights Amendment under the leadership of Jackie Speer that will finally write women into our Constitution. The authorization of an Inclusive Violence Against Women Act, Dianne Feinstein has led the way there. And the American Rescue Plan with uh, Maxine Waters uh, being such a leader as well as, as Barbara Lee insisting on dis uh, ad uh, addressing the disparity in delivery of services to our communities of color as well as addressing issues of poverty. In addition to that, Zoe Lofgren took the lead in H.R. 1, our bill for the people uh, to save our democracy. Uh, Lucille Rollett by Allard passed the Dreamers and Promise Act just the other day. Um, uh, the, um, Karen Bass with the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. The list goes on, as, as you can see, in our ARP, the bill uh, to crush the virus, put our children safely back in school, money in the pockets of people, and the um, workers back to work. We advanced better, uh, uh, better health care under the a ACA, and that lead was taken by Congresswoman Anna Eshoo, a chair of the Health Subcommittee in her committee of jurisdiction. So again, for the, there's so many reasons for us to be very, very proud. Because our state has suffered greatly from COVID in reflection of our large population, our work to address the disproportionate negative impact of the pandemic on women is of great consequence to women of, of California and their families. For, exa for example, COVID relief delivered with only Democratic votes will cut child poverty in half and provide um, help for the emergency and affordable child care in America that the pandemic has made worse, a burden that disproportionately falls on women. Our success in advancing these landmark and potentially life-saving pieces of legislation, including enactment of the American Rescue Plan, is the evidence of both the power and influence that women have gained with a seat at the table. In fact, a seat at the head of the table. This legislation is also proof, however, that the equal protection of women must be written into our Constitution without any ambiguity to ensure women's full equality under the law. Women in America, and especially the women of California, have made great strides in all sectors and in the political arena, but we want more because nothing is more wholesome than the increased participation and leadership of America's women in our democracy. Today and every day, we must continue to fight specifically for women's success and continue to build on our achievements to affirm and guarantee women's full equality in America. Because as we all say, because when women succeed, America succeeds. Happy Women's History Month to you all. Thank you. Greetings. My name is Carolyn Fowler, Vice Chair of the Women's Caucus. Let me take a moment to acknowledge my colleagues who work tirelessly with me on so many important issues that impact women and girls. You've met my chair, Christine Pelosi, uh, Monica Wilson, Anita Naranya, Lori Gazzini and Zini, Becca Doton, Seth Rosales, Fatima Gupta. Christina Dixon, Jennifer Ong, Alex Palmer Zucco. And now at this time, it is my honor to introduce our first presenter, Malia M. Cohen, State Board of Legalization from California. Malia is a native San Franciscan and a product of the San Francisco public school system. She's a rising star and nationally recognized policymaker. She serves as a member of the Board of Equalization and California's Tax Commission. Elected to the Board of Equalization in November 2018, she was the first African-American woman to serve on the board and as chair of the board in its 141-year history. As the BOE board member for District 2, she represents 10 million constituents from as far north as Del Norte County to as far south as Santa Barbara County. Her district is home to the ancient Redwoods, the wine industry in Napa County, the innovation capital of the world in the Bay Area and Silicon Valley, and the beautiful, uh, pardon me, and breathtaking Pacific Coast. 
which we enjoy so much. Prior to being elected to the Board of Equalization, Board Member Cohen served as president of the City and County of San Francisco Board of Supervisors. She was first elected to the Board of Supervisors in 2010 and re-elected in 2014. And on a personal note, speaking of being on the front lines, she is a new mom, and I must share a partial quote. She said, our daughter will inherit the world we will make better through our struggles and our commitment to justice. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking and welcoming Malia Cohen. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you to the entire leadership of the Women's Caucus. I just want to say hello, ladies. I think I heard you guys echo back hello. Hello to the fellows that love us out there. I'm excited to be here. You heard I'm Malia Cohen. Many of you have seen uh, and heard from me before. And today is a really unique time. I love that we are Zooming um, in a space during a, in a, during a precarious time in our history. But I am excited to join this group of truly powerful women leaders that have dedicated their lives to breaking ground and to what? That's right, making history. All the while, not even cognizant of the fact that they're making history. They are just doing, we're just doing what we do, which is just being awesome and bringing people along with us and a life of service. So let me begin again. I just want to express my thanks to Christine Pelosi for extending me an opportunity to make a very brief presentation to you all this afternoon. And each woman that you're going to hear from today are, is going to be incredible. Uh, they provide inspiration and hope um, to me personally. Let me tell you a little bit about them. We've got first uh, Dolores Huerta. This woman is a giant among giants. You know her, civil rights uh, icon, a leader who put herself on the front line every single day as stellar example of strong female leadership. Next up, you're going to hear from Lieutenant uh, Eleni Kunalakis, the first um, of her kind, uh, meaning a businesswoman, developer, United States ambassador. That is phenomenal. Who, um, who stands with us as the first elected woman governor. I want to note that uh, Mona Pascal served temporarily as an acting lieutenant governor uh, for a little less than a year. And so building on that, we want to recognize state controller Betty Yee. Betty Yee is a child of immigrants. She's the past chair of the State Board of Equalization, and she is only our second woman state controller in the state history, second to Kathleen Connell, um, who was the first in 1995. Then I want to acknowledge Fiona Ma. Fiona Ma, who is our first woman of color, certified public accountant, and she serves as our state treasurer. And you know what? This list would, would not be complete if we didn't recognize Kathleen Brown, um, who also served, and Elizabeth Whitney, who also served as acting state treasurer. And of course, you're going to hear from Tony Atkins, who is the daughter. I didn't know this. I did not know this. But Tony Atkins is the daughter of a minor and a seamstress. She is our first woman and first openly LGBT president pro tem of the state senate. You see what I'm saying? Do you see this theme that I'm talking about here? This is trailblazers that we're talking about. So each of these women in their own uh, unique and pow powerful way have been leading the way, have been trailblazers for us. And of course, like our great sister, Madam Vice President Kamala Harris, all of these ladies have been breaking glass ceilings effortlessly, but also leading and allowing a few sisters to come up behind them. And we are grateful for that. I wanna join, uh, excuse me, what joins all of these powerful women and quite frankly, what inspires me is the fact that each of these trailblazing women are unyielding in their pursuit of justice, of fairness and of inclusive, inclusive, inclusiveness. So one thing that we know for sure is that all of these women, we know that they're fighters, but they all recognize that, that we have not won until all of us are free, until every woman enjoys a seat at the table. And with that, I think it's important to stay, we say we need to stop Asian hate. And of course, we know that 
all, li all Black Lives Matter. So ladies and gentlemen, this is important. This is why we come together in this very safe space. This is why we're celebrating and uplifting. We are recognizing women on a, on a, on a, on a daily basis that are doing their work. Some we see and some we don't see. So uplift those women, put those women's names in the chats, women's names that we don't see on a daily basis. Let's speak their name. They bring us power. They bring us fire. And let's keep moving forward. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Malia, that was fantastic. You uplifted me and inspired me so much all the time. But today with your remarks, they were beautiful. I, I don't know if I can even follow you now. But I just want to remember, you know, I came out of the Communication Workers of America, and this was quite a while ago when we had operators. We had DA, direct assistance operators and O operators, and mostly women. And the big burly guys were the linemen and all the other, uh, and then we had different departments. But I will tell you, when we came upon having to call a strike, which didn't happen often, it was always the women that were the most courageous and these women were, many of them were single moms, didn't know if they were going to be able to make it the next week without pay because at a strike, you don't get paid. Although the union helps you, but it's not the same as getting a full paycheck. And the men were always the less courageous. The women were out there in huge numbers, holding down the picket lines 24-7 warriors. And they're the ones that made us get the good contract. So I just wanted to uh, and light everybody of how uh, brave these women were. And they're the ones that got us through these strikes. So, you know, my hat's off to those women that really made a difference for all of us, the workers, and especially in my union, because I lived it. You know, I became the acting chair uh, for about six months. And so I was the first Latina to ever be chair of the California Democratic Party during a really uh, unusual time. But you know, as women, we had to roll up our sleeves, make decisions. We got criticized for some of them. We're not perfect, but we did the best we could. And I think I left um, the headquarters in a much better place. So, you know, I just want to talk about uh, Latinas just for a little bit, because so many times uh, we got, we get forgotten. You know, Latinas still are the lowest paid workers in the American labor force. And we got hit with COVID tremendously. And not only did Latinas die in higher numbers, but they were some of the first workers to be laid off. And you know what? They haven't been rehired yet. So they're still out there trying to, to make a living. So I think we need to retain, retrain Latinas in the jobs of the future. The new Green Deal should be specially aimed at Latinas in terms of training and employment. So as a Latina here representing I say that uh, with much respect for all the women. And I tell you, the diversity on this call is amazing. I've been around a long time and that never used to be that way. And I would make all the women on this call honorary Latinas all day, every day, because you fight for all of us. And I really appreciate that. I just wanna make one uh, little plea to all of you that are on the phone. If you're not already a member of our CADEM 2020, 2022, please think about few dollars a month. It really goes a long way. You know, we're developing year round on the ground program that will mobilize voters and targeted seats. And you know, many of them are currently held by women and we hope to increase that number. So we can't do it without you. It doesn't come from the sky. It doesn't fall uh, on the laps or in the headquarters just like that, like rain. We have to raise it. And I think all of you can be part of that. And I'm proud to be part of that. I give every month and have been giving every month. So can we count on your support for the team today with a donation, even a little donation, even a few dollars, like I said, will go a long way. And in that, that same vein, I want to, the person I'm going to introduce is someone that I have admired for so long. You know, we had a farm workers office uh, out of the CWA uh, headquarters in Paramount, California, and uh, we did it with such pride and uh, never charged the farm workers. We knew they were working hard to try to build a union, so we were there, our home, and our doors were always open to them, and Dolores was out there. If we could, if we could rewind one day of Dolores Huerta's life, oh my gosh, we would be exhausted, 
and she is one that has given her blood and I mean blood because she was beaten by law enforcement for having the audacity to stand up for workers, sweat and tears. And that woman gives every day. She was blessed with an overdose of passion and energy like I've never seen before. God bless her and God continue blessing her. So I'm really truly honored to, to introduce her now. You know, many don't, don't know that she received a teaching degree it's, it's Stockton College and briefly worked as an elementary school teacher. You know, I'm giving you a little bit of history here. Dolores as a teacher, she resigned because she was distraught over the poor living conditions of her students. And many of them were the children of farm workers. She co-founded the Community Services Organization. Now we're really going back to some history. A grassroots group that worked to end segregation, discrimination, police brutality, and improve social and economic conditions of farm workers. And then she started the Agricultural Workers Association. And you know, Dolores, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I have the history right here where she set up voter registration drives and lobbied legislators to allow non-US citizen groups to receive public assistance and pensions and provide Spanish language, voting ballots and driver's tests. That was Dolores in the midst of all the other things she was doing she was doing 10 things at one time and doing them all well. It was at that time she met Cesar Chavez, who was with the National Farm Workers Association that was formed and later became the United Workers Farm Workers Organizing Committee. And then as we know it today, the United Farm Workers. Dolores is also directly responsible for taking pesti pesticides out of our food. And to this day continues to work as a fierce advocate for farm workers, she's a children's activist, she's a civil rights activist, LGBTQ activist, immigration and women's rights. You see what I mean about the endless energy? She was bestowed uh, many honors and awards in her lifetime, but two that I wanna mention is the Eleanor Roosevelt Human Rights Award that was given to her by President Clinton. And the, the latest one that she got, and now she's probably got more since then, but President Obama bestowed her with the Presidential Medal of Freedom. That is uh, the highest civilian honor in the United States. And that's so well-deserved by Dolores Huerta. So, and I know she was coined with the, and credited for the phrase, si se puede, that came from Dolores. So, por favor, bienvenidos nuestra hermana. Please welcome our sister, the Honorable, Dolores Fernandez Huerta. Thank you very much, Alice. That's a, a beautiful, beautiful introduction. I am so happy to be with all of these great women here in the California Democratic Party. You know, our party is so important because we know our mission is to make sure that people vote, that they're informed, and also to save our democracy. Okay, this is what it's all about. And I am so happy to be here with you. You know, I like to quote Coretta Scott King. And she had a great saying that I like to quote everywhere I go. And the, the saying is this, we will never have peace in the world until women take power. And we just think about that. And I have kind of changed that to say um, that we will ne never have, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> have peace in the world um, until feminists take power. And <coughs> so, uh, because we know that we have some of our, our male uh, Democrats out there that are also feminists. And that is so important because I do believe that we should never have any kind of a board meeting anywhere. If they're gonna make some kind of a decision out there, we need to have equal numbers of feminists at the table because if not, they're going to make the wrong decision. And we have seen the power of women leadership during this pandemic, you know, uh, when we, we and, and before that also, we the great women's march that started here in the United States and then and went universal all over the world our, our Black women leaders who started the, the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, the Me Too movement. And uh, we have seen such great leadership coming from so many women in our time. And we are so fortunate that we have our great leader, Nancy Pelosi, who joined us this evening because it was under her leadership that they were able to get the American Rescue Plan out of the house and over to the Senate. And now we know that, you know, she is somebody that has created so many laws that benefit working people, poor people, and of course, women. 
And I was very fortunate to be uh, with uh, Speaker Pelosi uh, in the state capitol you know, j just before the pandemic broke out, where she had a, a great celebration about women's suffrage. And, and last year we did, we were all having all these celebrations about women getting the right to vote. Well, guess what? We can make history in 2021 because we can fight for the Equal Rights Amendment for women. And that is now going to be also in the Congress. And so we really have to get together and think about all of the people that we know in the other states because it's gotta be ratified by the US Senate. They've gotta clear the way to make sure that we can finally put equal rights for women in the Constitution of the United States of America. And so we know that we can do it, but we've got to work really hard. And so I just want to uh, give you the website and it's ERA, yes, 2021.org. I'm going to repeat that. And maybe we could put it in the chat. ERA, Y-E-S, 2021.org. So please go to that website and uh, we have to call our friends and our relatives in the other states because we know we have two great senators, Diane Feinstein, Alex Padilla, uh, but it's the other states that we have to worry about, but we can make it happen and we can make history and celebrate the Equal Rights Amendment for women, finally in our constitution of the United States of America. And I know we are all grieving about what has happened uh, to the Asian women uh, that were killed in Georgia. And we know that we have to become the healers out there. We've got to go out there and keep working to get rid of the misogyny against women, the racism, the homophobia, you know, the climate deniers, all of that ignorance is that, that is out there. We're the ones that have to do the work to make it happen and to stop the creeping fascism that we know is here in our United States of America. And I just want to say one more thing. We have a lot of supporters that are men. And I want to congratulate one of our feminist uh, friends who just got a really great appointment from Governor Newsom, and that is Rob Banta, okay? The first Filipino American to be a state constitutional officer who has just gotten the appointment to be our attorney general. So let's congratulate Rob. He's a very uh, progressive, he's a feminist, and he's somebody that will definitely fight uh, for all of us women here in the state of California. So I just want to thank you very much for all the work that you're doing. And we're going to go, go out there. We're going to keep on working. Que viva mujer. And si se puede. Gracias. Gracias. Thank you to legend and icon Dolores Huerta for your beautiful remarks and for bringing awareness to the ERA. Hello, fellow Democrats, and thank you so much to our speakers um, and our party for standing in solidarity with Stop AAPI Hate and Black Lives Matter. I'm Secretary Jenny Bach, and today we celebrate a month of women's history from our fabulous women elected leaders and warriors uh, to women heroes serving on the front lines every day, our caregivers, healthcare workers, restaurant and grocery store workers, hotel workers and essential workers who leave their homes every day during this pandemic to put others first. You know, we have so many essential working women who are low paid workers. So as we celebrate, let's not forget that yesterday was equal pay day, calling out for pay equity for working women who have made substantial contributions to our well-being, workforce and economy. So thank you all so much for your incredible service. Um, and if you're enjoying party events, like this one, um, I'd like to just make the ask uh, that you please consider supporting the Condemn Training Department by clicking the link in the chat. Um, our amazing team behind the scenes will be putting it in the chat now, uh, and we so much appreciate your contribution. Um, so, you know, now it's with my um, just Distinct honor to introduce a California trailblazer, a mentor to so many young women in this state, and California's primary banker, California State Treasurer Fiona Ma. Fiona is California's 34th state treasurer. Um, she was elected in 2018, becoming the first woman of color and first woman CPA elected to the position. As treasurer, her office has worked swiftly to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic, offering resources to small businesses and expanding access to healthcare facilities. 
She grew and re revamped the state's affordable housing and homeless housing programs, funded clean energy projects and, and to create new jobs, and dramatically increased California's ability to save for college, retirement, live with a disability, and achieve a better quality of life. She has also worked to bolster support for our K-12 and higher education. So without further ado, let's extend a warm welcome to Treasurer Fiona Ma. Hi ladies, this is Fiona Ma, your California State Treasurer. Happy 2021, happy Women's History Month. Um, so excited we are able to celebrate at least virtually uh, in our little squares uh, this year. But it has been very, very rough. I'm sure all of you agree. Uh, frustrating, confusing, depressing, and we have made it uh, through most of it, and we do see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, personally, as your state banker, managing over $2 trillion uh, a year, um, not knowing uh, when revenues were gonna come in consistently because of the deferrals uh, and the delays, and then waiting for the stimulus payments uh, from the federal government, not knowing when they were gonna uh, come in and still having to invest all the state's idle funds as well as the uh, 22 uh, local government units. Um, that has also been uh, a little bit stressful uh, in terms of all the money out there, yet uh, competition for short-term investments, and then also issuing bonds uh, to keep people working even during this recession and COVID. Uh, we still issued uh, the record number of bonds. The credit rating agencies did not downgrade us like other states. And even last April, we were the first in the market, uh, back in the market with our GEO bonds, which was still well received. Um, luckily, this past week, uh, we have been oversubscribed on our general obligation and revenue bonds. So uh, that's a good sign for California. Um, I also did about 150 or so webinars for small businesses, individuals, nonprofit seniors, food relief, and uh, tax, tax relief and food access. And we set up COVID-19 resource guides, which are on my website, www.treasure.ca.gov. That is updated in real time. Uh, for federal, state, local, and even private sector resources. Uh, so we have been on the front lines uh, trying to assist as many people as we can, match them up with the needed resources, and we also set up a dedicated email address, and that is askfiona at treasure.ca.gov. And we've received about 900 COVID-related emails uh, because people could not get through uh, to the 800 number or they didn't get their check or they threw away their prepaid card. So we encourage you to reach out to us. Uh, we wanna be here of service. We thank all of you for all you do as mothers, as wives, as daughters, uh, as our sandwich generation worried about, you know, our parents as well as our next generation. But we are women, we know how to multitask we know how to get things done, and we will get through this together. Thank you all, and look forward to seeing you in person soon. Hi there. Hi. <laughs> Hi, this is Yvette Martinez. I am the executive director of the California Democratic Party. I just wanted to offer a little tidbit. I wanted you all to know that our uh, staff is 68% female. And what Fiona said is exactly right. We know how to multitask and we know how to get the job done. Our team is working so hard to prepare for the convention that's coming up at the end of April. And we're really excited uh, to present something fantastic for all of you. Um, you know, our staff is uh, tireless right now. We have, some of us have kids at our sides are still, you know, doing the work from our homes. We are not able to get into the office yet. We sometimes do, we stagger our time, but the, but the point is what Fiona said is right. We're getting it done and we're really proud to be working with 
so many fabulous women uh, that are here tonight and who are behind the scenes um, on our team. So it is my great honor to introduce the President Pro Tem of the Senate, Senator Tony Atkins. Senator Atkins is the first openly LGBTQ woman to lead the California Senate. She's also a former Speaker of the Assembly and former San Diego Council member. Throughout her career, Senator Atkins has been a champion for affordable housing, the natural environment, healthcare, veterans, women, and the LGBTQ community. She has shattered the glass on many occasions, and we are so grateful. California Democrats, I present to you Senator Tony Atkins. Hello, I'm Senate President Pro Tempore Tony Atkins, and on behalf of the California State Senate, I would like to say a heartfelt thank you to all of the women who've been at the forefront of the COVID-19 pandemic. When I think about everything women have done and continue to do during this absolutely unprecedented time, it's amazing, but frankly, not surprising. Women historically play this role. Consider the grocery store workers who kept our shelves stocked, the teachers who held Zoom school from their living rooms, the military service women who kept our nation safe, truck drivers, child care workers, mail carriers. And again, we aren't surprised that it has been women who've borne the brunt of the pandemic recession. According to the Legislative Analyst Office, 53% of jobs lost during COVID were held by women, while others had to leave jobs to stay home with children. Here in the California Legislature this year, women have led our efforts to secure evictions, protections, and relief, ensure that vulnerable Californians receive the Golden State stimulus and small businesses had financial help, and allocate the resources our schools need to reopen safely. That's more than $16 billion of aid since January alone. We women kept working day after day, month after month. I know all of this was hard for women, even absent a pandemic, and especially for women on the lower economic rung. I'll never forget watching my own mother struggle with the challenges of poverty and caring for us kids while working as a seamstress. Given the historical balancing act women bear, I have even more appreciation for the women balancing distance learning, their children's isolation and parenting, an exhausting task, not only for working mothers, but for all mothers. And I can't help but think of the women in the eye of the storm, our healthcare workers, women like Becky Buckingham, an ICU nurse at Kaiser Permanente San Diego, who found new ways to help patients heal. Dr. Karen Reluccio, Napa County's public health officer who led the county's response to the coronavirus pandemic. And Dr. America Bracho, CEO of Latino Health Access, who pushed for the public release of data to illustrate the inequity highlighted by COVID-19 and the disproportionate impact it's had on Latino communities. We honor them and all the women who have persevered during this immensely challenging time. And that includes California women like Vice President Kamala Harris, Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who worked tirelessly to secure the support American families need, despite the other side trying to undermine the relief that's contained in the American Rescue Plan. March may be Women's History Month, but our gratitude for all the amazing women who are helping us get through this crisis is ongoing, as it should be. Women continue to be the very foundation for society. Chairwoman Pelosi, thank you for always focusing on the role that we play as women and the leadership provided by so many women on an everyday basis. Hi, everyone. My name is Becca Doughton. I'm the treasurer of the Women's Caucus, and I'm excited to uh, wish you all a very happy women, Women's History Month. And also, uh, what an incredible lineup of speakers we have today. Um, thank you for everyone who helped bring this together and for all of our speakers for being here. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing uh, the California State Controller, Betty Yee who is amazing and dynamic, just like all the other speakers we've had here so far today. She's no stranger to those of us who've been working in the Democratic Party, having, intended, having attended our state conventions for years and always taking the time to come to and address our Women's Caucus and work with all of us to help uh, further uh, champion the efforts of the Democratic Party. She is a true champion of the people of our state 
and I want to share a little bit about her background and history for those who may not know her. She's a native of San Francisco and a proud product of its public schools. Betty was born to immigrant parents who built a laundry and dry cleaning business from scratch in the Parkside District of the city. With the help of her family, community, public schools, and teachers who went the extra mile, she rode from minding the books of the family, family business to minding the books of the fifth largest economy in the world, California. She was elected to the California State Board of Equalization in 2006, re-elected in 2010, and represented close to 9 million Californians, excuse me, Californians. Prior to that, she served as the state's budget director. Currently serving as our state controller, Betty is on our side, holding government accountable, working to ensure income and retirement security, protecting our environment, and taking on big companies more interested in lining their pockets to make sure doors of opportunity can stay open for every California to fulfill their dream, raise their families, and thrive. For those who do not know, I had the honor of working for Controller Yee, and I can personally attest to her incredible heart and her amazing mind. She's a true public servant who cares about all the people of our state and is working every day to make lives better. With that, it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce our California State Controller, Betty Yee. Thank you, Becca, very much. Good evening, Women's Caucus, and um, thank you for that warm introduction. And um, Becca, thank you for just your service and, um, and being an amazing deputy on our team. You know, I think about tonight and how I'm joined with all of our amazing elected women leaders and so many of our community leaders. And, you know, it's a time where I think we're all taking stock a year after the beginning of this pandemic. And first, I just have to lift up my own team in the controller's office. Um, you know, at the very start of the pandemic, we had to really be sure that all of our team members were safe and remained healthy. And so we moved roughly about two thirds of our, uh, of our team into teleworking arrangements. Uh, but with that, uh, I just have to say the biggest compliment that we received in the early months of the pandemic was how the controller's office uh, really became California for California's fiscal first responder. Um, we didn't miss, miss a beat. Uh, every um, business that uh, was a vendor with California got paid. All of our local governments got their allocations on time. Uh, millions of Californians received payments from the controller's office in terms of tax refunds and pension checks. And uh, a state employee uh, was always paid timely during this uh, very, very uncertain time. And so just uh, really uh, wanted to uh, uplift my, my own team. But really why I think uh, we're all here tonight is that we recognize that uh, women's leadership during this really uh, unique time uh, is not about um, power coming from position. It's about power from really serving our communities. And I wanna just pay tribute, particularly tonight, as we talk about women on the front lines, uh, to many of those women who uh, don't, don't see themselves as leaders, but really who are. And uh, particularly as I think about uh, so many who don't have a choice but to work uh, during this pandemic, who are at increased risk of uh, contracting the coronavirus and who really have um, not been among uh, those of us who have been able to see a bright future. And yet they do this because they wanna provide for their families and they wanna to continue to have a livelihood. And I just wanna uh, just uh, give a shout out to so many of these women. And I know that uh, they could not do this work, but for uh, those women who are leaders in our labor movement, uh, who continue to give them hope, to continue to give them voice, and uh, also to know that uh, they are essential and they are valued. And so I know we have some labor leaders among us uh, and I just have to give a shout out to our sister, Dolores Huerta. Uh, I know Ada Brasano is here uh, with Unite Here Local 11, um, you know, you know, Gloria Alvarado in Orange County. I mean, these are all the women who continue to just uh, uh, really lift up our women who uh, just see every day as just a challenge, but we know how much their work really matters and is a value. I also need to just say that there are many women who have been uh, supporting all of us, but who aren't um, visible on the front lines. This has been a particularly hard time for all of us in terms of the trauma that we have seen around us, perhaps even in our own families. And I wanna give a shout out to those who uh, in the faith community, uh, those who have been uh, there just to help us with our spiritual uh, health. And, um, and we know that uh, their service has been just invaluable uh, during this time. And I also wanted to say, um, you know, we talk a lot about how we're going to get to the other side of this pandemic, and I don't know about you, but I'm feeling very, very hopeful about the fact that uh, vaccines are increasing in supply. 
hopefully all of you will be vaccinated soon. And uh, but there were uh, the truth of it is that there were many women who were on the research lines developing this vaccine at warp speed to be able to get several of them to market and now into the arms of uh, so many of us here in California and throughout the world. So these are the trailblazing leaders that we see um, uh, that have been a big part of this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, but who we don't really interact with on a daily basis that we have to pay tribute to as well. But I also wanna just say to um, all of you um, as um, a fellow sister, um, just a deep gratitude for all of the solidarity that has been expressed to the AAPI community during this very difficult time. It is a time where uh, we know that in order to combat hate and to continue to advance in terms of our role uh, in this economy, in this society, that we're going to have to uh, just lock arms in solidarity to combat that. And uh, I know that all of us have been working on that together. Uh, we will continue to work on that together. And uh, my greatest hope, frankly, is that uh, we are going to see a world that where the future uh, is women and where we see that uh, all of us will be supporting one another and the biggest lesson learned from this pandemic that each of us is essential to the other is going to be given voice by women because we have been there for each other we have uh, held each other's hands uh, we have been the ones who have uh, provided for our families uh, we have been the ones that have provided the care uh, for so many who um, just uh, have not been able to uh, really see um, much uh, assistance from their healthcare providers and I just want to also say um, how innovative we are. I'm so heartened every day to see how we're providing for new needs every day. When food banks were um, running low on supply and were closed, we saw mobile food banks being developed by women in their communities. Uh, when we saw that um, child care was short uh, in, in, and child care centers were uh, shutting down, uh, we saw many parents begin to uh, provide that service. And so I'm just really uh, I can't say enough about just what we have done, but I, it gives me great hope as well. So as we celebrate Women's History Month in this year of 2021, I know that it will be a bright future. It will be a future that is woman, and it will be a future that frankly is gonna be free of discrimination. It will be free of hatred, and it will be free of uh, just everything that has uh, set us back because we know that when we can step forward together and lift each other, up and, and just be sure that uh, every voice is heard and that we're elevating women's voices, uh, we are in good hands. And so thank you all for just uh, having us tonight. And uh, I'm inspired. And uh, more importantly, uh, I know that uh, when we get to the other side of the pandemic, it will be a bright future for uh, our children once again. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Controller Yi, Betty Yi, Fiona Ma, Malia Cohen, Dolores Huerta, Tony Atkins, Speaker Pelosi, can you believe? I mean, and the thing about all these women, they don't just come to the Women's Caucus at convention, making their, their tour of the caucuses. They come at eBoards, they support our coffees, they support our work and trainings throughout the years. And, and we really, really appreciate it. And another person who um, had her roots in the California Democratic Party, um, First back in the early 90s is our next speaker, the 50th Lieutenant Governor of the state of California and the first elected woman, our dear friend Mona Pasco was appointed to fill the term of John Garamendi when he was elected to Congress, but the first woman elected, it was a glass ceiling election, Eleni Kunalakis would say, as she traveled to all 58 counties of California to spread her message after coming home from Hungary where she served for the Obama-Biden administration as a representative in Budapest. And I just want to tell you a couple of things about Eleni uh, that you might not know. One is, um, I've known Eleni for a very long time. Uh, you can trust Eleni because I trust her uh, with the spiritual care of my daughter. She's Bella's godmother. So really, there's no greater trust um, you could have in someone. But I want to tell you what a friend she was to the LGBTQ community. When she was ambassador in Hungary, there was so much vitriol, the anti-Semitism, homophobia, transphobia, really a lot of terrible, um, a really terrible hate in the rise of Orban, who was a mini Putin and a precursor to what, what Trump had tried to do here. And one of the things that Ambassador Sokoblis Kunalakis did was to do what no ambassador, American ambassador had done before, which was actually to march in the pride parade and to uh, waving an American flag and a pride flag. And the message that that sent 
in that country was really phenomenal. I mean, there are, there are people who don't even do that in the United States, much less um, in a foreign country as an ambassador um, of the United States of America, much less in a repressive country like Hungary. She saw it first. She saw the dangers with Orban, and she knew what she was fighting in Donald Trump. And she also knew the importance of building civil society because she's done that as a businesswoman. She's done that as a philanthropist. And now she's doing that with a real focus on education and making sure that the students and uh, whether it's community colleges or vocational schools or um, at California's wonderful state and university systems really have what they need to have the opportunity that education brings and to be able to continue to pursue that dream during this time of isolation and pandemic. So please welcome a great friend of the caucus, a great friend of mine and a wonderful Californian our Lieutenant Governor, our first elected woman Lieutenant Governor, who continues to make history and progress, Eleni Kunalakis. Eleni? Oh my goodness, Christine. Thank you so much for that lovely, lovely introduction. Uh, you know, this has been so inspiring watching and listening all of our extraordinary California women, uh, one after another, from your incredible mother, our speaker, our great leader, Democratic leader, a two-time speaker now, uh, Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who's been a mentor and a friend to me since I was a kid, first thinking that one day I might run for office so many decades ago, um, to hearing Fiona Ma and Betty Yee and Malia Cohen, Tony Atkins, Dolores Huerta, oh my goodness, uh, Alex Rooker, who did such a wonderful job leading the party. It has really been remarkable, and it is a testament, Christine, to one person you left off of that list, and that is you, Christine Pelosi, because the work that you do in organizing the Women's Caucus of the Democratic Party has left an indelible mark in advocating, lifting up, and electing women in our state and getting us to the historic high levels of representation. So um, Christine mentioned that um, I have been really focused over the last two years in public higher education. So since we're talking about women on the front lines of this extraordinary time, this global pandemic, I thought I might just say one or two words about what uh, my office has been organizing around um, when it comes to public higher ed. And let me just say that is not to um, uh, minimize the work we've been doing um, in environmental protection, the work I have been doing um, with the governor's office and representing our state as our uh, state's chief diplomat um, in the uh, uh, area of international trade and investment. But my heart very much is in California system of public higher education. Many of you have heard me say this before, but since it's Women's History Month, I just would like to remember uh, my grandmother, my Yaya Katarina, she never went to school. She never learned to read. She never learned to write, but she was fierce in defending her family and protecting her family in the Second World War. And she believed so much in the promise of America that she let my father come here, age 14, no money, no English, to make his way to the fields of California as a farm worker, and then on into our system of public higher education which changed the trajectory of his life and all of our family's lives. So to be in a position to be able to help keep this California dream open by helping make it higher education in our state more accessible, more affordable, and more equitable has been a great privilege of mine over the last two years. So I just want to say a couple of things about what's been going on in public higher ed. First, most of you know that more than half of our general fund budget in the state of California goes to education. That's PK-12 all the way up to public higher ed. But in public higher ed, we have about 3 million students currently enrolled, more than 2 million students in our community colleges, and then the balance in our CSU and our UCs. The massive transition that has taken place in public higher education from in-person to online has been extraordinary. Just in the CSU, just in the CSU, they started, we started with about 7,000 online courses 
and with a matter within a matter of about two weeks, moved it to about 80,000 courses. And of course, this happened system wide. Uh, when it comes to uh, dealing when in the middle of the pandemic, we had within our University of California hospitals, that's where all of the testing was going on and all of the uh, all of the work being done to get uh, the uh, uh, testing on vaccines, the testing on therapies, incredible contributions of our University of California to getting us to the point that we could see the light at the end of the tunnel, which of course is vaccinating our people. And now looking forward into the future and what it's going to take to ensure that we get our people back to work, particularly those in small business, particularly the uh, Latina women who Alex mentioned, who are in desperate need of the tools to be able to get back to work, the, the training opportunities and the focus that we need to place on, on women of color and people of color and underrepresented communities. Our CSU, UC and our community colleges, this is where we're gonna do it. And let me just thank the wisdom of the leadership of Speaker Pelosi who knows this. And how do I know it? Because she designated $5 billion of the American Rescue Act, $5 billion will come to California for our system of public higher education, half of it for emergency needs for our students. This is incredible. When I look at the future of recovery, when I think about women on the front lines, I think of the extraordinary women who play a part of our public higher education and that next generation that goes through the doors of our colleges and universities in search of a better life for themselves and for their family, but in the meantime, that lift our state up in terms of our society and in terms of ensuring that we will continue to be the fifth largest economy in the world, providing more innovation and opportunity for everyone. So uh, Christine, it has just been such a wonderful thing. I, I hope everyone feels the way that I do, just absolutely full of, uh, of inspiration and excitement as we heard so many of California's women uh, speak today, so many firsts. Uh, and really so much of the future of our state that will rely on the leadership of California's elected women. Thank you, Christine. Thank you so much, Eleni, and happy 200th um, Greek Independence Day, Opa. And uh, I wanna thank each and every one of you for joining. Uh, as when we were thinking about this theme, we thought about how blessed we were to have so much quality and equality and diversity um, amongst our, our elected leadership, whether our officers, Jenny and Alex, our statewide um, elected officials, um, Eleni and Fiona and Betty and Malia. And yes, I'm using all of their first names because we're, that's how we are in the Women's Caucus. And of course, our legend, Dolores Huerta, um, who is doing vaccine clinics um, in the Valley and, and, and really a part of making sure that we, the women on the front lines know that we are with them. We have some tough times ahead. And I think that, you know, we, we know that, that people are frustrated and I think that we need to honor their feelings, honor that frustration, but also show them that help is here and hope is on the way. The American Rescue Plan will have a fact sheet that I'll, I'll tweet out and we'll post that talks about what the American Rescue Plan specifically brings to California, as some of our speakers have mentioned. And we'll talk about the ways in which we can organize around making people's lives better. So many of you activists, I, I can't wait for us to be together again, but as we're here, physically distanced, but socially, connected uh, spiritually and politically and in every way. I just want to thank the people who, who've done so much work for us. Thank the wonderful staff, Yvette Martinez and, and her team. Thank Kat and Josh and their team. Thank our sign language interpreters. I know I talk very fast um, for our ASL friends. Um, so I'm gonna give your hands a rest in just a minute, but I did wanna make sure that I thanked everybody thank all my sister officers, thank of the Women's Caucus, thank all of our siblings in service who joined us today. So please go forth, support Democrats. Your ballots are there. 
Um, if you're a if you're a delegate, don't forget to vote. You can vote right now on your phone if you want, and um, make sure that, as Alex said, you support Dem 20, 21, 22 because it's grassroots leaders like you who are going to make sure that California Democratic women remain blazing new trails on the front lines every day. Thank you all so much.